Hello and welcome to this CodeBuddies.org hangout. In a CodeBuddies hangout, you can ask questions, work through tutorials, share ideas, or pair program on open source projects. This is a collaborative session. Today, we're going to be hopefully getting to a minimum viable um, kind of stopping point or proof of concept for this coronavirus mapping application. Um, essentially, we the original project, the request has already been met by another company, and this uh, project kind of went down two tracks. One was to create a mapping application where people could report feeling symptomatic, feeling uh, coronavirus symptoms, and we would map that um, data at a granularity of about 100 meters accuracy. So sort of private, but um, highly detailed. And in the process of developing that app, we started to do clustering so that we could group the data together and make bigger patterns stand out rather than having just a bunch of uh, data points all over the place. And it was also brought up that we might be able to use the platform to visualize existing data and some discussions around uh, what options there are. And after going through and reviewing several data sources and other projects that are visualizing coronavirus data, um, it's just not a good fit for this project. And there's some really, really excellent um, sources. One in particular is Our World in Data. It's just remarkable. I think they have, let me just put the link here. So certainly don't want to reinvent the wheel. That's, uh, this has been a really great learning opportunity. Um, and very in interesting discussions. Okay, and uh, one second. Sorry. <laughs> I've got a new setup on the Twitch um, stream, so I'm just getting familiar with that. So sorry for the echo there for a moment. I muted the video. I do want to make this stream much more participatory. It is a hangout after all. We should be interacting and um, chatting together. So let's see the stream elements. Stream elements hit its own message. That's interesting. <laughs> I'm using this. A few new plugins, some overlays. So let's just quickly take a look at what um, our world and data provide. And if my screen glitches over here, I'll try to be mindful of that. I think when I have windows overlapping, there's a little bit of glitch. There's some kind of weird, hard to uh, reproduce issue. But uh, essentially, they give lots of really great summary visualizations and comparative uh, visualizations. You can see the sort of exponential phase of confirmed deaths and rolling averages. In some of these, you can actually start to see the tapering effect as company, uh, countries get over the exponential phase and sort of this logistic growth. Here's a good example of Iran, Italy, China. Is this? Yeah, China. So, I mean, these are just excellent. Uh, you can see there's how often they double. If it's got the slope of, of this, it's doubling every five days. This slope doubles every day. This slope here doubles every 10 days. And all of this data of the site is open. It's open data. You can just view the data and sources there and download it for your own uh, download the chart as png but you can also download the data and actually the code that makes the charts is all open source so that's my recommendation and i'm glad to have found this resource i've come across our world and data in a different context than when i was searching for um, some statistics about transportation and carbon emissions um, but i didn't really uh, just connect the dots uh, that they would be a, such a great resource for COVID-19. Okay. So we've also done a couple of um, 
a Jupyter Notebooks here just to explore the data locally uh, from a couple of sources. One is from the um, Our World in Data and another one um, I think is from Europa. And the idea with that initial exploration was to see if it would be a good fit for the mapping platform. And as I said earlier, it's not because um, that that data is aggregated by country. So the country level data um, is too coarse maybe for doing these types of clustering or heat maps, which was the initial goal. I thought we could improve on some of the reporting. I think there's a lot of um, significant issues going on right now with uh, with coronavirus reporting, not only in the way the data is visualized and communicated, but also just the availability of data and the reports um, of the severity of um, the pandemic could be, um, certainly it's, um, no joking matter, certainly it's uh, very concerning. But also I think we're, I was reading uh, an article by a professor of statistics who was saying like, the data we have on Corona is very sparse, and at the cases where the data where we have um, basically tests, where we're comparing tests, for example, I think there's one here where you compare tests versus infections. These suffer from a selection bias on a couple of levels. One is um, Rich countries, maybe, accumulated total tests. Well, Vietnam, India, Australia, South Korea, Canada. There may be a, a bias like uh, where kind of richer countries, these are, um, this is a logarithmic scale, right? Uh, United States, Italy, and populous countries, but certainly where you can afford to have the tests, they're doing the tests. And also, the people who are being test, tested in a lot of cases are people who are already symptomatic or are um, more vulnerable. So there could be a selection bias uh, where it's hard to, to extrapolate from the testing, the ratio of people who tested positive versus negative to the population. And all that to say is um, this has huge costs and we need to be very careful about what conclusions we draw and how we communicate those conclusions, including the data visualizations we choose. All right, that's my main takeaway here from this experience. It's been quite uh, educational. All right, so do feel free to ping me in the chat. I'll try to um, take any questions, comments, um, any ideas that you have for the project and I don't have a link to this source code this is an open source project on github let's go ahead and uh, start the project so I'm running poetry for our dependency management this is a Django project We'll go ahead and run the server here. And yes, so one thing I need to do before running the server, I need to start up our um, um, Postgres and PostGIS um, container. So we have a Docker Compose image that'll just spin up a, a PostGIS instance for you. If you want to run this at home. Might be might be a little bit overkill uh, to have selected PostGIS. At first I thought I would be doing geospatial queries, but uh, the project has gotten simpler in scope. So I could probably switch back to like using floats or something for the lat lawns. And today we're going to be doing mostly some JavaScript stuff. But essentially what it boils down to is um, a form where a person selects their location in the world. 
and the date they first felt symptomatic and they they submit a report and these reports get clustered together so if we zoom in a little bit we should see now that the reports are separating and uh, by default the clustering uh, for open layers is uh, pretty minimal it doesn't uh, I mean there was a leaflet plugin we were looking at when I, this project was still using leaflet uh, that has much more elegant styling and uh, in the last live stream I did get pretty far down this um, path with open layers I'm just going to continue down the path I, I still think it was a, a decent decision to go with open layers you know there's trade-offs um, whoops earthquake clusters here we are what we're going to end up hopefully with is something more like this where hopefully the proportional symbology won't be so big We'll have to see how these circles are being scaled. If it's radius or area, it should be area, but that's something that's uh, should be really, in my opinion, abstracted from me, the in de developer. I should just be able to kind of plug my data into a map and go, and that's not been the case with open layers. Everything in open layers is very, fairly low level. You have to really have a lot of concepts in your mind when you're building an open layers map. You have to, well, you have to start thinking about uh, you know vector layers that you're putting your data into but vector sources that actually is how you get your data into the um, layer and then you know the clustering layer and then you start going down to styles and you have these classes um, which may or may not you know be optional if you it's if you want control over the styles and this uh, tutorial is also somewhat dense um, so that's going to be a little bit of a challenge, but we'll work through it. Like I said, I've already gotten further down the road, in fact, the last time, but for some reason I just uh, was kind of feeling tired and just decided <laughs> to throw away that work. It happens. Sometimes you throw away your work anyway, and sometimes you throw away your work mistakenly. So that was the case there. So we have a coronavirus mapper, and we have a reports app, and our template is the map template. And essentially what we're going to do is we define all of our JavaScript here. And in fact, um, I should just be working in a JavaScript file at this point and, and load it in. So let's just do that as the first step. And this will be static, so I just need to This is really doing a lot, but it's essentially everything to do with the maps. And Django has a helper to get the URL of a static file. Static URL, I think, should be set. And I'll try to keep my eye on the chat too, in case anybody's um, participating over there. So we actually need to go into the mapper. Just double check these settings. Hmm, that's good. And then load static. And our template. Static file. And I think Django is intelligent enough, so to speak, intelligently designed to kind of de determine that we're in a development environment, so I don't have to collect that static. I just need to use the correct path. So without the static prefix, it would just be JS reports. save that and 
essentially the block based um, templating language will um, include this in the correct section. And if I refresh the page, it should just work unless we get a 404. So that looks like the case we're going to. And the path is not correct. JS reports reports JS. I don't know if I have to run collect static on this. Or else it's not serving static from the apps. That could be the case. So let's double check the static files. is in the I think we have to be here in the apps it's right here oh yeah there it is Maybe I need to re either rerun the server or enable debug. Debug should be enabled though. So, whoops. We just stop the server and start it again, see if it picks it up. And double check the static file structure. Alright, this is the issue. basically did this except I, I didn't use the app name as a second level that's okay though it should be all right let me just see if it worked with the uh, server reboot restart yeah there we go okay so the sometimes Django doesn't pick up the file system changes right away when the server is running so if you're adding a new folder for example maybe doing configuration relating to things that read off the disk you just have to reload the server And I'm not expert in Django by any means. This is a completely a learning journey. Everything, all this open layers, Django, it's all pretty new to me. That's why the project's interesting. All right, so now what we're gonna basically do is, hopefully we'll have better linting now. Uh, now the VS Code can see that we are in a JavaScript file, let's just see. If I save, control shift down. Save format document. Yeah, well, at least it knows we're in a JavaScript file. make any changes here all right so let's just go ahead and redo the code so far so there's more JavaScript now I was anticipating in writing were 150 lines um, but essentially what we're doing 
there's a couple of things. We have two maps. We have a map in the report form here, and we have a map in the base template. And I could probably split these out into separate files so it's a little better organized. So we have a base map that's going to get data from adjacent endpoints, convert those to features, and create a uh, data source, cluster layer, and a vector layer, and then put it all on the map. So we're going to go th into that code. Let me just, uh, this is unnecessary now. Um, and would be used in the modal anyway when we're submitting the data the anonymized location I don't want to save too accurate of data so what I did what I ended up doing was well, I'll just put it here it looks like I've, I've taken that out in subsequent work Here's the initialized report map. All right, so now this is going to be a lot easier to keep track of what's going on in each of these files. So we need form.js. Reports map or something like that would be a better name. We refreshed, everything loaded there. Reports map works. If I add a um, report down here, submits the data, there's the report. All right, so that was a good refactoring. make it a lot easier to know what's going on when we're going through this complicated part here. So now we want to work with the clustering. So let's, oh.
that's relating to this um, field here, this flat picker field. It will work from either of the JavaScript files, but uh, yeah, it's relating to the modal, so I'll put it in modal JS. Cool. And I've also been um, updating the stream settings. I, I lowered the bit rate on the audio and the video so that it would not take up so much bandwidth. I think I was taking up twice the bandwidth I need. So if, let me know if the um, text is hard to read uh, or anything over here, or the fonts, or if my voice sounds funny, or anything like that. But I think this should be a good bandwidth. It's a 1080p broadcast, but I was, uh, I think, broadcasting like 5 megs or something. It was really high. All right, so we're done with the modal for now. Now our clustering essentially is we create an open layers map, we make a request, and we put the data on the map. Um, and that's about it. It boils down to that. What we need to add, though, is in this clustering section of the map, and perhaps the vector we're, and the map in general, we can define some styling and um, it's really flexible, but it's also really verbose. But you know, it'll unhover and give you a new interaction. So when you click or hover, you'll see the actual points. Uh, it'll cluster them together and give you a count of the number of points, which is also really useful. And hopefully, uh, we can avoid these circles extending too far beyond the geographic scope of the data. But all of these seem relatively close proportionally to the data aside from maybe it's not all circular but that's another another option would be to use some sort of um, like a polygon that overlaps all the data points but then you'd, you'd want these to be mutually exclusive I'll just go with the circles <laughs> so they have these style constants, we're just going to pop these all right in, <laughs> more or less verbo verbatim, and then I'll change things up as I go. Uh, there it goes. And I've got lint on save, which is nice. And for JavaScript people, you probably irked that I'm using four spaces. I normally use two spaces in JavaScript as well, but um, well, so it goes. Uh, how do you do comments in JavaScript? <laughs> I was thinking double slash, but then for some reason, the Python style. All right, good. All right, so this um, create earthquake style. I'm just going to again copy this verbatim and rename it because it's not, not only is it not earthquake style, but it's um, it would be more clear if it's a layer style or a marker style. And what I see here is this is actually a marker style because we got these points, etc., that are how you make the stars. So each of the earthquakes has uh, a symbol that appears on hover and it's initially hidden. radius based oh you can make it oblong alright now here so I'm just going to put a little note there to remind myself The report point, from the best I understand. Then we'll want this is the nice one that gives us the proportional scaling. I believe this line is unused. Uh, we have a, a vector layer that's created 
layer down here, uh, right here, this cluster layer, I think, or it could be this source layer, one of the two. I'll just clear that up. Actually, this is crufty code. We're not using this right now. Since we have a bunch of features. Oh, we are using it. Right, so you need some features, then you put them in a source, then you put the source into a cluster layer, then you... Oh, yes, yeah, so there was the source and layer. They have similar names. Let's come back to it. But I think what this is going to be doing is it's going to be helping our cluster source. We'll go into that, and this is overly complicated. And I believe this is the map style function. Uh, no, this is the cluster style function. Yeah, for each element. So this is point style function actually. If this is a single um, point, we are just going to return a default symbol, which will be like a small circle, which is uh, defined up here with a with a radius. Hmm. Fixed radius. No, no. Oh yeah, okay, yeah. Because each of the stars, it has still it's still scaled based on the actual magnitude of that particular earthquake, and then you have scaling also in the clusters based on the number of clustered items. So we're going to just give this a fixed radius to simplify it. So it is definitely this is going to be create point style. Or just create reports points. Yes. And let's just do that here while we're there. And um, this can be static because our report is a single instance, so we don't actually need any of these, which is nice. Radius can be essentially three by three. I don't know if you actually need both of those, or if I omit them, it might. Uh, oh, and actually, I want this to be a
see how we just need one radius. And this is what makes open layers so difficult. It's like, uh, it's just kind of hard to distinguish the difference between a, a style that has geometry in an image and a circle style. And if I need that um, circle style to go in the image, and the docs are fairly comprehensive when you know the API already and you know the concepts. And so when me as a new developer working with this library for the first time, it's just been kind of a challenge. Essentially, we've got a fill, a radius, and a stroke, and a displacement if we want. So fill, stroke, radius. So it is circle style, I hope. All right. Well, I just want to get the basic thing working, then we'll tweak it. I have to just understand what it's doing. And so what this is essentially doing is um, choosing a, a style based on whether this is cluster of items or a single item if it's a cluster then we're gonna oh yeah here's good uh, we're gonna return a style with a circle style as the image radius and a new fill so that could be defined up there with our static um, um, styling. But I believe these are up here so you can reuse them. I don't know. If, if we don't need to reuse these strokes then and fills, then I think it, it could also be defined down here. This is what puts the style the in the middle of the circle the the count of features a little bit of space makes things easier to read It's going to be choose report point style. Or I 
Actually, just choose feature cell. style function, select style function. I think we use that in another place. Okay, so I see. Well, let's just get this. I think we can just do this. So we'll get the extent for that individual feature and we'll extend this overall extent, um, which is the cluster extent. I guess we can just call it the cluster extent and I can get rid of this. I don't like these types of loops. Uh, I think they're more performant in JavaScript, but I just don't like to read them. Uh, okay, but let me just see here. So. Hmm. 
So we have this max feature count here. Essentially, it's just this. Feature count. So we're just keeping track of the maximum. That way you can scale them proportionally uh, against the max. function but since we're iterating over them here another one of these loops okay I think this is that cluster light, cluster vector. So simply these features will be cluster features. Is that gonna be cluster layer or cluster source? Well, this is a vector and this is a vector. So if it's not a vector source, all the features are here. But they're not yet clustered until we get here. Then I believe that's going to be what we're lo looping over here. Cluster, I guess, source, so cluster features. And that's that. And we'll come back to it in a minute. And we we're going to get rid of these, I believe. Yeah, I don't know why you need to find that outside of the function anyway, when it's only, it's just defined in one place. So I think that's redundant. Just define it here. Then for this feature, we're not going to need to grab that because we're going to actually loop over these. For cluster feature. But do we use this length anywhere? Uh, Because we defined the original features here, and I didn't change that code, so. I need to return something here. I 
unless it was just to mutate that, that this whole thing could be just for that side effect now because we want to feature to do something with this feature Actually, that could be the side effect there, just mutating this cluster. I think I can delete that too. Yeah, there's no return value used here, so it's just to mutate these cluster radius radii and then feature count I guess all right well hopefully this will work so That's right, the vector they were calling it vector here, we're calling it cluster layer with a vector with a cluster source, and that's what's going on here. Alright, let's just get this other function. So select style function is applied to the map down here. And a function is a function, so we don't need to call it a function. It's a verb already, so select map style is good enough, I think. Let's look map style feature, and then we want to come down to our map definition. We have two layers, a tile layer, and 
this is pretty nice actually. Ah, wait. Mm, that's right, because we're adding the. layer here which means we can't access this variable without a scope I did work out a way to do this before let me get this style in here real quick So what this is doing it every time um, it's so it's adding interactions to the map, the default ones, and we're adding an additional interaction uh, for a selection. And um, we're looking for a point move or a click with a pointer move or a click on a on an event. So if I move the pointer over there, or I click on it. It's interpreting both. So that could be for the touch event. Uh, if either of those, uh, it'll be true. The condition will be met for this, and we will then invoke this function. All right. So the only other problem we're going to have is that we're trying to access this cluster layer. outside of this scope and that's not going to work. Because we don't have the data up front on this example. They're instantiating the vector source. with a URL. So I might be able to do that right in the cluster layer if I could use this. They imported it with a different name.
All right, I'm going to take a quick break. I'll be right back. I think I'll be able to figure this out. I've, I think I've done this once before, but I can't remember what the solution was. All right, well, one option occurs to me. I can move everything into the success function, so all of that map set up in, in the rendering. I can go right there into the su success. So that would work.
So I guess this is for each interacted feature. This is strange that we needed an invisible circle there. I guess it's so you can still have the event, maybe? The mouse event? That way you'll still have the same radius for the mouse event, the mouse off event. I might be able to do something like this. In a, in a I guess they're just doing it so they have a global state. The vector layer will be global.
Well, in any case, I think this is an improvement. And then... All right, let's see how broken this is. <laughs> I think we got most of everything here. So yeah, the map view and target were already set. All we've done is add a new interactions, which I thought were already there. No, the clustering had some default interactions, and now we've added new ones. All right, let's just ready, reload. And I'll have to chase some errors. I think I've not prefixed everything with OL, for example. So let's start there. 404, well, that's actually not bad. Fill is undefined. All right, there we go, report JS line two. Ah, now this is much nicer now that we have the um, code in its own file. It points me right to the line. So I think this is ol dot oops ol dot star dot fill. Yeah. And I'm not using these. You know, I probably should be using these imports, but I'm, I think these are just ES6 imports. Yeah. Yes. JavaScript. When did the import become a thing? ES 2017? I don't remember. And more importantly, I guess, what's the browser? <laughs> compatibility. Oh, not even. There's no Internet Explorer compatibility. So, yeah, that's one of the things that was sort of decided early on is because of the nature of this project, I was hoping to support back to. Um, Internet Explorer 9, so Internet Explorer's never gotten that, but Edge has it, so that's interesting. So. Yeah, so I'm just going to use this. No big deal. Alright, let's see if I can catch a few more of those before we refresh. Ah, text. for the imports I could see with a quick scan. All right, check out our console, refresh. Of defaults. Refresh that. See if we still get the four hundred four. Can't find this. This is now called modal. Alright, 
select is not defined. 127. Map clusters not working really though. Console okay. Circle circle style is not a constructor. I think it should be circle style dot circle then. Okay, no errors. And we got some, some stuff happening. Oh, yeah. So those hovers are working. That is cool. There's definitely progress. I like it. Now we just got to figure out the radius stuff and we'll commit it. Excellent. It's been a quiet <laughs> chat. Nobody said a word. All right, so. I don't think this is a problem due to the cluster layer. I think that's all happening. One way I could figure that out. Well, I would have an error here. It's like, get source wouldn't work, right? So, this should happen on the interaction. Oh, okay. So that's never happening. All right. And we're never choosing feature style. That's the problem.
Yes, this is the style for the uh, the vector layer style. Choose cluster vector layer style. Naming things is difficult and leads to a lot of confusion. Okay, good. Yes, create empty is not defined. <laughs> it's different errors, that's why I'm excited. Uh, this is no problem. I'll just do empty. I don't know, over here. There it is. And where do we import that from? This is exciting. I hope there's not many more of these errors though. <laughs> Let's see, create empty, create empty, create empty. So it's trying to do that on all those. That's right, that's about right. Extend is not. This is the same one though. Oh, extend, extend. Anything else? That we're getting from extend. Get width, get height. Oh yeah. See, it almost seems like the get width and get height should be a method of extend. But I don't know. It is what it is. All right. Let's see. Oh, look at that. Boom. Boom tastical. Boom. Blap a doom doom. All right. Well, it's the proportional symbology thing again, but this lets, well, Kind of strange because there's got features way out here. I don't know how the clustering works underneath the hood. Hmm. Well, we got something working now. That's good. Like this point should be with this cluster, it seems to me. What if I just don't scale? I just want to see what happens. It's going to be horrible, I bet. Yeah. Here we go. Maybe just a little less scaling. It's still back to same difficulty where we're having it's difficult to interpret we do it's also encompassing some isolated points it's almost like we shouldn't be using a circle geometry here I mean, this little point down here is closer than these points to this circle. And this is a layer that's not in my control, I believe, unless there's some 
sitting here in the cluster layer that I overlooked 40. What if we do that 20? Hmm, yeah, that's not really helpful, is it? Well, maybe it is actually. Leave it there. <laughs> That's a good balance with accuracy and proximity. Really cool. All right. So I'll commit these, push this up there. Hey, what's up, Imperium? Welcome to the channel. Going into lurk mode, I see. Let me just read through the code a little bit to see if there's any things I can improve for readability. In your code, yeah, definitely have comments. <laughs> I totally agree with your teachers. And not just comments that are like, well, like not just like get features extent, because well, that's already kind of apparent, but m more of like the why you're doing stuff and not the how. The code is supposed to describe the how by using, you know, meaningful variable names, meaningful function names, things like that. Have you read, um, what language are you working in, Imperium? JavaScript? I can't remember. Have you read uh, any of the clean code habits? Mostly Java for school, Python for side hustle. Yeah, cool. Let's see, let me get this, Clean Code Python. And uh, actually the book, Clean Code, I think is written for Java. I don't know, maybe not. Let's see, Handbook for Agile Software Craftsmanship. Who's the publisher, is it O'Reilly? spammy site, but uh, one second. Print is hall. Print is hall. There's Pearson. Is Pearson part of Print is hall? subscribe what I'm getting at though this is a really good book and it might be specific to Java and it's been ported to these other languages like Python so here this is the point if you check this one out and there's actually a book on Pact that's pretty decent as well that we just saw there. Clean Code by Python. You found the free PDF? Yeah. And this is actually essentially not all of the, I think, lessons in Clean Code apply to all languages, maybe, I'm thinking. Some of them are specific. Uh, 
I'm not sure exactly, but this uh, I use this one, and I use another one called Clean Code JavaScript when I'm going back and forth there. It's really good. Explanatory variables, super useful. You know, you don't need comments if your code has clean variable names and, and useful function names and functions that are small in scope, but definitely I try to explain why I'm doing things and not how, because later on I don't always remember why I put some code in to do like that. And as we saw from this code example I ported over from here, it's very difficult to name things. And as a person trying to learn, it makes it even more difficult to learn. So, what kind of project are you working on now, Imperium Mar? Yeah, you're welcome. Thanks for hanging out in chat. I appreciate having somewhere. Hey, my chat's not working for some reason on the hangout do you see your messages on the chat I wonder if they just disappear after a certain amount of time oh I see they they are there but they they like disappear after a minute don't they hmm I'll tweak that I'm trying to improve the stream a little bit make it more interactive Catching up with school. Yep. made this chat really big sorry about that <laughs> Good grief. I think I must have hit some keyboard shortcuts by accident with the chat selected just need some labs and projects done for computer science reading a chapter in discrete math and learn about tension and physics OBS is pretty rad. It's pretty powerful. And then I added the Streamlabs to there, and uh, it's pretty, pretty useful. A lot of cool widgets and stuff. Yeah, there we go. And the comments are all working and stuff. Excellent. Got everything line, aligned back up there. I'll try to get the comments to not disappear. But I already spent like five hours to get all this, everything set up, <laughs> something like that. It took a while, trial and error and stuff. All right, so we're good to go. Um, Yeah, that makes sense. I think that's like relating to the schema theory of education. Who, who? Learning through schema theory.
Essentially, if you have a schema for something, you have like a structure in place and like a you know, like a mental model or something, and it's easier to stick new bits of information onto that mental model. Like you can imagine if you're sculpting or something, and you have like a the torso, like there's art sculpture torsos. Uh, and you pose it and then you can put your clay onto that sculpture bit by bit and it'll shape up a lot easier than uh, if you're just putting clay clumps together with no structure in place for you, no framework. So kind of interesting, interesting idea. Well, cool beans. Looks like we got some stuff working today. And I think that's about it, to be honest. I didn't um, plan on doing too much more of this. I just kind of wanted to get to a stopping point and push this code up, so hopefully it's useful for someone in the future. There's, uh, by the way, uh, Imperium, have you seen these um, data visualizations? I think you, in fact, asked, you know, if I'm reinventing the wheel, and are there some other data visualizations? And I, there are some excellent ones that we found. Um, Our world in data. This is a really cool site. So I'll just make sure you've got the link there as well. Did I ever make games? Uh, I was planning on actually making, working on a game uh, over the weekend, and then somehow I just got all my time, sleep schedule got all mixed up, and I just didn't do it. But I, I'm planning on making a game. Uh, using the Godot game engine. So, are you interested in, in game development? A live simulator, cool. Yeah, my son and I are playing um, Animal Crossing right now. The Animal Crossing New Horizons. <laughs> Yeah, like a story-based game, that would be cool. Yeah, that sounds pretty neat. And um, my mom used to play The Sims. That's a pretty cool one. Yeah, you could probably make that with the Godot engine. Would it be like a 2D game or a 3D game? Or what kind of what kind of game mechanics would you have in there? Are there any games that's similar to? Are you interested in making open source? games anyway this is an excellent site this our world and data has some really cool visualizations here That's cool. So you're like, you get the menu and you're like, I want to be, or I want to live here and I want these parents and I want to go to this school. Like you pick out all your, all your stuff in advance for, for your life experience. And then the challenge is to live up to all those plans. That's the game mechanic. <laughs> But can't choose parents' location. Yeah, that's, that sounds about right. <laughs> I wonder. Results just by tweaking that slightly. It's a little closer, ain't it? Kinda, kinda not. If I zoom way in, uh, kinda. It's a little bit better, I think. 
go with it. Okay, so it's going to take place in just one country. Interesting. Like a life manual, how to live your life kind of thing. See if I can get those uh, chats to stay up a little bit longer while you're in here. Before wrapping up the stream. All right, so I've got some widgets here. If I look in my chat box. Oh man, do I have to reconfigure the whole dang thing? Bits badges. Turbo badges. Subscriber badges. Clean, I just want to be Twitch. Yeah, something like that. Text color, font size, hide messages. Always show messages. That's what I. Hi, come in, sir. What if I should mute myself? Hmm. One second, and we're gonna uh, do. I'm changing this chat real quick. Where is this at? Where is the chat? There, chat. Chat, chat, chat. I call it a community chat or something. Oh, here it is. All right. Hey, it's hanging out there now. It's staying around. I'll refresh the cache. All right. Yeah, so if you say any messages now, it should just leave it up there. Not too bad, not too difficult. Boo! Didn't work. Yeah, it should be working. I see it still hanging up, there, hanging out there. Let me. There. In other words, your messages won't disappear anymore. It had a 30-second window where they would disappear. Oh yeah, sorry. Using <laughs> the camera. That's true. <laughs> nice. Very cool. Well, let's see. Yeah, where are we at? Stream wise, nice. I was only playing streaming a couple hours. We're, it looks like we're about two hours in, so this is a good time to probably um, call it good. In any case, Imperium, um, I'll probably be streaming again, let me think, Thursday, m maybe a little bit tomorrow evening, I'm not sure. i got to kind of figure out what project I'll be working on next. There's um, some data transformation I need to do for a website migration, so I'll be using some Python for that. Um, maybe we'll do some game development in a little bit. I'm thinking I'm going to put this project down for a little while. It's now at a good stopping point. Uh, and learned quite a lot. That was nice.
yeah, so I'll just have to do some more reflection on what the next steps will be. But yeah, thanks for hanging out. And yeah, if you got some ideas um, for games or whatever, um, maybe we could do some game. Some uh, I'll do some like a uh, Godot or something, Godot Engine, and you can check out how that works. See if it's something you'd be interested in making your games in. Uh, and that way we can learn together and, and share share lessons. So all right, what about the idea ideas for websites um, or apps? Yeah. I do actually. I have a kind of grandiose idea. Grandiose. I don't know how to say that, but it's a big idea. And I might just start doing it. It's relating to geography and, and quite a lot of um, ideas that kind of melded together um, in my brain around Christmas time when I had a lot of time off work, you know, for the holidays or whatever, and uh, just a lot of time to sit and think and some anxiety. Um, that was kind of, I was just th sort of reassessing <laughs> uh, just things, and so I was thinking if I would pivot to a bigger um, open source project. So yeah, that's uh, it's basically like relating to um, sustainability and uh, sustainable cities and stuff. So yeah, actually, if you're interested in some, uh, I'd be making it in Python and probably some JavaScript on the front end for um, the visualization. And in general, or actually in specifically, I'm really interested in this e-charts. I'd really like to, to uh, start digging in here. Uh, it's so powerful. It's originally created by Baidu, so a lot of a lot of their documentation is in uh, in uh, Chinese. Uh, okay, yeah. So now now you're getting me on these different channels. That's one problem I've had within life is like focusing on one thing and not spreading myself too thin. But yeah, I I also do play piano, and I've been studying music and actually I've got I've started a, a music app on a, a stream and I thought were you actually there when um, when we were doing that music app I could pick that back up as well and I've got a specific some ideas about that I could show you the links uh, really quick oh dang I lost them well it uses tone JS as one thing. Make a game that involves music. Yeah, that's cool. And music's pretty important to almost any game type. So even if we make like a, a life simulator or like a space explorer or, or anything in, in Godot, for example, uh, there would be a musical element to it. I actually have an idea for a musical com uh, composing or composition app that's like kind of drag and drop blocks for um, making music that abstracts you a little bit away from the individual notes and into the higher level deal, uh, details like oh, chord families and things like that, and chord function and a key. So that would that would be fun. And I, I had this cool. Uh, Found this JavaScript thing that uses Tone.js underneath it, and it's like for generative um, musical composition. But, uh, I don't know if I can find it again. Yeah, I think I printed this article here, in fact. Maybe? No, no, no. See if I can find this real quick. So 
Scribble tune. Found it. <laughs> yeah, so essentially, um, I, we already started experimenting with this open source music app. Oh, yeah, the music is central to the game. So it's like a, an element in there. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think I, if I were to do something like that, I would probably be just more interested in doing this com this uh, this um, composing environment because I think I've also got a couple of good ideas here, and it could be generally useful for sketching out musical ideas um, and then exporting them as MIDI so that you could edit them in a digital audio workstation. Yeah. So this scribble tune is pretty cool. You kind of scribble out. And that's kind of like that actually analogy I was thinking of. It would be so easy to sketch music, you'd like feel like you're scribbling it out. You wouldn't have to really... Um... I've tried, you know, working with notation software like MuseScore. And uh, it's just really cumbersome. And makes it slows down my process. Because I have to first... I'm still learning MuseScore. And even then, I think if I got really efficient at using it, I, it would still be much slower than than I would be thinking in terms of writing music, and so I would hope that a musical interface could approach the speed of thought, in particular when that would support like these schema, these musical ideas and uh, schemata from mainly tonal or functional music, but also maybe modal music, but not something too too far afield. I still enjoy tonality. Yeah, so these are good ideas. Imperium, maybe we can uh, work on those in one of the next sessions. So yeah, let me get my get some clarity, and I got a meeting tomorrow about this website where I'm porting it over data. That's priority number one, is to get this da uh, data migrated to the new version of the website, but um, maybe on a weekend one of these projects will be fun to pick back up like the a generative music sort of composition environment or a game. That sounds good. All right. Well, I don't think uh, there's much in terms of credits today. Just when I mentioned a featured charity, Age UK. I'm trying a new um, aspect of the live streams where it'll I'll have a, a featured charity in each session. I'm, I'm doing um, donation matching. So for every dollar or every euro donated, I'll match it one to one. I'm keeping the goals kind of low. Um, so that I can also afford <laughs> to match the donations, but I just wanted to try it out and see if it would work. So um, these donations are going to, directly to the charity through um, this Just Donate. I think that's what they're called. And uh, I'll match them up to 100 euros for the goal. So if you're interested in donating, you know, I think, well, I think the minimum is five euros, but I can change that. Uh, you can click the link below, or you can scan the QR code, or visit this Frama link, which is just a URL shortener that takes it to the campaign. And the reason I'm using this link is so that your name will appear in the live stream when you donate. It's linked up to the Twitch channel. So if any of the um, Twitch viewers visit that link and make a donation, then they'll get credit on the live stream as well as this little donation bar will fill up. Cool beans. All right, well, thanks again. This has been a CodeBuddies.org Hangout. Hope to see you all around the CodeBuddies community. Thanks again, Imperium, for joining up and being so uh, communicative. It's nice to have you around. Have a great day.